Welcome to Global Citizen Life. Today on the pa- on the podcast, we have Charm. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Sally, for having me. It's um, it's a pleasure, and I can't wait to see what we get ourselves into. I'm excited too. So let's let's go back a little bit in time mm-hmm. and talk about kind of where you grew up and where you're living now. Okay, I grew up in Bristol, England. Um, well, born in Bristol and raised in Birmingham to be exact. And um, I have Jamaican parents. So, you know, back then Jamaica was in 19, in the 1960s, Jamaica was a British colony. So you mm-hmm. could go back and forth, right, with just a visa. And a lot of Jamaicans would go to England for a better life. So my mother was six months pregnant with me when she took the leap only knowing my uncle in England, six months pregnant with me and went to England by herself with a with little baby in her tummy just because she wanted a better life. And uh, she got to England and um, stayed with my uncle for a couple of months and then ended up you know, at the hospital and thank God for socialized medicine. Um, they, they gave her, you know, they gave her help and, and welfare and whatever they called it over there, but it was assistance. It was government assistance. They put her in a little place with me and uh, she started her little journey by herself with this little girl in England. And she met my dad shortly thereafter, about a year later, he adopted me. So on my okay. British, uh, on my, um, on my British uh, birth certificate, it's stamped adoption, which it wasn't before. Because of course, when I was born, I had her maiden name. Right. And then years later, when I was applying for my passport again and everything, they said the birth certificate was wrong and they sent me a new one and it had adopted stamped on it because my dad actually did adopt me and give me his last name, Francis. So, but when I was about nine, my mom decided that she, that a lot of her brothers and sisters had moved to, migrated to America and they were like, it's a little better here come here, right, with us, and we can Mm -hmm. help you thrive. So she packed me and my brother up and moved us to England, but she did not tell us. She just told me we were going on a little trip for a visit. So, and, and, And one of the reasons why she didn't tell me is because I was a child prodigy. So I was very, very smart, very inquisitive, and could read at two and three years old. As soon as I could talk, I could read. And if she told me, I would have like given her the business right. I, but bad enough, she didn't tell me. And I already knew uh, February, the day that we were supposed to come back home to England, because I had looked at my my ticket, my round trip right. ticket, and it was February 26th, 1973. So I had packed my bags up the night before to go home. Ready to go home. As a nine-year-old, as a nine-year-old, right. So mm-hmm. I got up early that morning knowing what time the flight was and said mom get up get up it's time to go home and she said we're not going home so that's how I ended up living in the United States and yeah a lot a lot went on there with getting a green card and living living that life and my aunt back then you're somebody has to sponsor you Mm -hmm. so my aunt sponsored us got our green cards and then Later on, we applied for citizenship, but it was not an easy road. Right. Not an easy road. No. School, things like that, it wasn't easy. Um, but here we are years later, and I live in Atlanta, Georgia, which is where I chose to live because we okay. moved so much when I was a child. I never, it was not unusual for me to spend, spend six months in one place and be gone to another place and be gone to another place. My mother just always wanted to find the right place for her and she was not afraid to move. She was not afraid to get up and move. So I'm not afraid to get up and move. However, you know, as a child, you need a little bit more stability and a little bit more roots. So she had gotten me, when we were living in Washington, DC, that's just one of the states we lived in. She used to, I love to read and I love the Essence magazine. So she 
saw that every time I was in the, 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 uh, the grocery store, I'd run to get the magazine and thumb through it before we'd leave. And so she was like, mm -hmm. you know, it was, a, it was a nice surprise, but she got me a subscription for my birthday, I think it was. And one of the subscriptions talked about all the successful women, black women in Atlanta, Georgia. And I said, mom, when I grow up, I'm going to be a successful black woman in Atlanta, Georgia. I don't, that was just the state I picked. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, I was 12 years old then, and I was like determined, I want to live in Atlanta, Georgia, and I want to be a successful that's, Black woman. That's, you saw that's where all the successful Black women were, and so that's where you were going. That's right. And I made that happen. I made that happen. By the time I was 22, 23, I was on trek trying to get to mm -hmm. Atlanta. And I've been here ever since, even though I might move sell my house in Atlanta, have to move somewhere else because of work. I'll sell my house there and move back to Atlanta. I've done that 30 times. Okay. Maybe now instead of selling, just rent it. <laughs> <laughs> no, right? Thank you so much, Sally. That would have been really great. And I wish I had met you before now. <laughs> right. Yeah. Kind of late now to say it, but. I really did need to just rent it. But I, back then I never thought to do that kind of thing. I, I mean, we never know where we're going to be in the future, right? We we don't right. know when we're moving. We think like that's it, and and maybe you know sometimes it's good to just let things go because even if you come back, you could be in a new area. So even though it's the same city, a new area, it's kind of like a new start. You can be in a different part of it. So yeah, 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 yeah. So I live currently. I live here in Atlanta. Love it. Okay, great. And so. You moved around a lot. So you moved to a lot of different states. So how yeah. was that kind of been as a child for developing friendships and uh, uh, going to different schools all the time? I went to a couple different schools as a kid, but not, we didn't move that much. Oh, it was, it wasn't good. Right. It wasn't good. Um, like I said, um, I was a child prodigy and I can't even imagine where I would be if I'd had more stability. Mm -hmm. So, you know, friendships, I had to make the decision. <laughs> I had to make the decision when I was 13, we were living in DC or Maryland. And I said to my, and, and the, the longest I'd ever lived anywhere was Rhode Island, Providence, Rhode Island. When we left New York, we came to Providence and I spent maybe two or three years in Providence. And I gained the most relationships and friendships there. Mm -hmm. So when my parents moved to DC, that was just too much of a transition for me. There was a lot of bullying going on. I had a British accent. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it just wasn't, it, you know, I wasn't well received. You know, I can say this just, you know, I wasn't black enough and I wasn't white enough. Okay. It just, it, you know, so you just fall in this crack, right? So at school, I'm not accepted by black people and at school, I'm not expect, accepted by white people. Uh, so it just, it was just too hard for me. And I almost developed anorexia nervosa. I just didn't know what it was. Okay. So I started losing weight, um, but I thought it was the coolest thing. And it was just because I was eating less, you know, you, right. you're depressed. Right. So you're eating less and I'm seeing these results on the scale. And I'm thinking, my goodness, this is amazing. So I started eating less and less because right. I thought it was cool, right? I thought it was cool. Mm -hmm. And my mom happened to take me for a physical and the doctor took her aside. She tells me the story later. The doctor took her aside and said, listen, she's not happy. She's not doing well. And she's losing a lot of weight. He said, you're very fortunate because she's not vomiting. She's not doing anything. She's just, she's just not eating. Right. But that's the only thing that she can control. Right. You guys are right. I'm getting a little emotional. It's the only thing she has because right. you're not allowing her to stay in one place. You're not allowing her to adjust and meet friends and be able to, you know, so she's this is the only thing she can control. So he said, you're very lucky. She has no idea what that word means. She has no idea what it is, but you've got to send her, you've got to allow her to control something. So my mom, like I said, she was, I got to give her credit. You know, she, I didn't know till years later. And 
I told her, well, I just want to go home to Rhode Island. I'll go live with my aunt. And that was a very hard thing for a parent to hear, right? right. I don't want to live with you. I want to go home to my aunt in Rhode Island because at least that was my, that was stability. When we came right. to this country, we moved with my aunt and my three cousins and we, we formed our little bond there. And mm. then my mom got her own apartment, but we were just up the street. So okay. at least I could go to my aunt's house every day and I could see mm -hmm. my cousins every day. And that was my only source of stability. Right. And my mother's got itchy feet. She's a Sagittarius. Dear God, they can just roam all over the planet. They just have to do that, right? Um, yeah. And so I, I, I went back to my aunt and my aunt put me in high school, classical high school in Providence, which is an, a, a, a school for the gifted. And you know, you have to take an exam to get in. And they had just skipped me a grade in DC and I was going to college in George Washington University in DC, a special program for gifted children. So I skipped a grade and then came to Providence and went from seventh to ninth to no eighth. Now that okay. was a real challenge, but mm -hmm. you know, I developed really good friends uh, in high school, you know, mm -hmm. that helped me that tutored me. I want to say that my best friend in the whole world was Maureen McCartan. Uh, I lost her three years ago to pancreatic cancer. And, um, you know, we were 14 when we met and we were still in love when she died at 57. You know, we, uh, we spent all those years keeping in touch. And now I'm the, uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm a surrogate mom to Meg, her daughter, uh, who's 23 now, but that being the case, that is when I finally started to develop some relationships and some friendships that I've kept lifelong. Right. So do you, from that experience, do you, are, are you on kind of like either extreme kind of end of the pendulum, I, I guess I'll put it, where you find it very hard now to develop? still those friendships or do you get good friendships and, and hold on to them really strong? Are you still kind of in the middle? No, I have amazing friendships all over the world. And I, and, and I think that might be me, right? I'm very open and, you know, I'm a life coach. I love people. I love the collective. So I think the, that's the reason why I suffered so much as a child, because this is who I am. So when I wasn't able to form those relationships and give people love and receive it, it was detrimental to me. Once I was able to come into the fullness of me as a, you know, as a teenager and, and was able to be st stable, mm -hmm. I was able to, I was able to flourish, right? Thrive. And right. so I have thousands and thousands of amazing people around the planet that I love and that love me. Um, so I wouldn't have known this if I hadn't known the other. So the other is important. Mm -hmm. but it being is true. Right. Being confined and, and not being able to form those relationships made me appreciate relationships mm -hmm. with people that much more. And being global, right? My, my company's name is Global, Global Coaching. Um, I, you know, it doesn't matter who the people are, what the nationality is. It's very exciting to me to find that common thread, to connect with them. I, I absolutely love it. I absolutely, I absolutely love it. My sister-in-law is, is uh, from Cambodia and I'm the niece from Bali, you know, just, just, just everything, everything. Mm. That's, I've got that's a beautiful fantastic. tapestry. Yes. Uh, that is, it is great. And, and so um, Atlanta, Georgia is, is home, but you've also mm -hmm. had to move abroad for work for a period yes. of time. Yeah. You said you've moved away from Atlanta and then you come back. Right. And so how, how was, where did you go and, and how was that kind of transition in time? Oh, it was rough. I went to Germany. <laughs> okay. I went to Aachen. I went to Aachen, Frankfurt, Belgium. Um, where I did not speak the language. Mm -hmm. The people were wonderful to me because I would be spinning around in the middle of the street. 
Um, I only had to do it for three months, but it was that's a long three months where you can't speak the language. And um, you asked the hotel staff, could you, um, I need to take the train um, and I need to go from here to here. You know, could you map it out for me? And 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 uh, and they're like, oh, sure, be happy to. And so you, they put it in a lovely envelope for you, and you leave out and you go get a cab. When you open the envelope, it's all in German. <laughs> of course, right? I'm like, oh my god! Please, Jesus, help me! <laughs> oh, no. I had this piece of paper just walking up to anybody that, because you know. Uh, anybody that would get, I make eye contact. I would walk mm -hmm. up to them, smile, and hand them the paper, and they would look and they would, oh, and they would be so sweet and they'd, and they one would put me on one train and then they might say to somebody else, help her when she gets off of this train to get her to that train or, oh dear God. So oh, nice. I mean, uh, there's so many wonderful, nice people in the world. There they really, really are. There really are. Oh my gosh, yes, there, there really, really are. So um, I, I did France, I did Germany, and then I did England. So I got to go home and I got cousins there. They picked me up at Heathrow and it was so nice to see them because they had actually come to the States on several occasions to visit me over my life mm -hmm. over that time. When I was a teenager, those same cousins had come and spent time then when I was in my 30s, living in Florida, those same cousins had come over. So now nice. here I was in my 50s and I called WhatsApp. And that's the, that's the main, right? That's the main, you know, WhatsApp. WhatsApp yeah. me. And I WhatsApp them and said, I'm, going to, I'm coming to London. I'm going to be there for like three weeks. And they were right there front and center, right there at the airport. That's amazing. Yeah. So yeah. Great. But it was the, the work. I mean... They do things so differently. Like I'm a nurse. And one mm -hmm. of the reasons why I had to fly over there is that we had had a failed launch in Europe. Now I saw it coming, but they didn't listen to me. You know, leadership <laughs> team doesn't they didn't listen to me. I said, you're making a big mistake. Uh, mm -hmm. If you don't send me over there early, you're going to end up sending me over there later. And it's going to be a botched launch. And it was a botched launch. And, um, you know, just like nursing um, over here in the States, Nurses have a whole, our scope of practice is much broader than it is there. Okay. You, over there, if you go into the, if you come over here and you go to the emergency room and you need IVs, the nurse is going to mm -hmm. start the IV and they're right. going to give you, right? The doctor's going to say, start the IV and give them some D5 normal saline. Mm -hmm. Over there, the doctor starts the IV. Really? I hope they have a lot of doctors on staff then. It. So there you go. The doctor was in the operating room. The IV needed to be started so the patient could get the drug that I was was helping them to administer, but the drug had a shelf life. Wow. And the doctor was in the operating room and the drug expired right in front of our faces. Oh no. Mm -hmm. And it's a it's 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 a tough thing because you make that particular treatment with the patient's own cells. It was an immunotherapy. Okay. And it was the first of its kind in the world. So I had told them, listen, we don't know logistically how they do things over there. It would be, it would make more sense for me to go over there and help them incorporate it into how they do things so right. that they'll know their timelines and they'll know how they're doing it. And my people told me, now nah, they'll be fine. Yeah. And they weren't fine. So the very first time they just let the, the thing, the thing expire. And then I get the call in the middle of the night. Oh, you need to fly to Europe. I'm like, not so fast. It's Christmas. We're going to oh. have to wait now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to fly over the whole entire Christmas holiday and do it. And I was like, nope, we're going to wait till January the 7th. Right. And, um, you know, so. But and that, that's. Since I would, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I say that that's something for, you know that people really kind of need to know too, that in all businesses, not just like, mm -hmm. that's a great example for, for that, for nursing, but in all businesses, we should never assume that how we do something in whatever country we're living in is going right. to be the same as the way they do things in another country that we're potentially moving to or, or going right. to. 
And we need to really look at that because the way things are done can be very different. Was extremely different. We did not see that coming, but their Mm. scope of practice is completely different. Now me as a nurse, I had a feeling that it was different because I've met nurses from other countries right? and they come here, right? And they come here and they're like, oh, we are not allowed to do that in our country or we do that different in our country or we use different equipment in our country. Mm. So I got that sense for sure. Even even from Canada to the United States, there's things that are different. So I was many years ago, um, an emergency medical technician for an, on the ambulance, an EMTA. Mm -hmm. And I went down to the States to do some of my practicum and things for being on the ambulance. And Mm -hmm. there we like, here we can give IVs, but we can't take blood, which was really weird because you got to stick them with a needle anyway. Um, But down there, it was very normal that um, to do both. And so there was a little bit of conflict. I'm like, yes, I know how to do this, but Mm, am I allowed? I'm here. So yes, I am, but no, I'm not. And right. so even, even just between Canada and the United States, um, yes. within the healthcare industry, there's changes a bit, but other than that, generally a lot of, of, of work things are very similar. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So very different though, but you would think that mm. they were, you would think, we, you know, you just yeah. think about us in Europe and, you know, we just think we're the same. You think it's the same other than maybe some little yeah. differences, but to start an IV, yeah. take blood, it would be the same. Right. They make them, they make them take the NCLEX completely over every country. If you come here, you've got to mm-hmm. take the NCLEX completely over again. You're not a nurse when you get here. Right. But, and it's interesting though, but you can arrive with a visa to be a nurse and that's why you got here. Like this is what right. happens in Canada with doctors too. We yeah. need so many doctors that will bring doctors over, but then, oh no, now you have to go to school for, <laughs> I don't know, like two years yeah. or something to be a doctor here. But that's, but we let you here because you're a doctor, but now you can't work here as a doctor. Like it, yeah. in, in a way it makes no smart. sense. Like I get, okay, do the training, have things lined up, but they don't even have that lined up. No. Like, so, no. yeah. Yeah. I met many doctors that were, were um, working side by side with me that had to go to nursing school or with phlebotomists while they're going back. A lot of them don't go to, to be MDs again because that's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. And like I get, if we do things, procedures are different, policies right. are different. Sure, you Agreed. have to do some some courses and some training. But let's right. be honest, the human body with medicine is the human body no matter where you live in the world. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Right. A hundred percent. So, uh, you know, it gets really kooky but and I and I understand like because you don't know what the standard is and you don't know how they they were trained but that's something we could find out we could get the curriculum and we could do curriculum for curriculum right Mm -hmm. but I don't know if they even because in Europe they'll 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 argue that their curriculum is more robust I don't know because I didn't go to nursing school in Europe I do not know right but I do know we should look at it Absolutely. We, and, and it's good to look, you know, no matter where you are to look at other ones, because there's always improvements. There, there's always like, and I've heard many stories of, of how things business is done. That's very different in Japan. Right. And, and how you greet people and with business cards and, and everything. And it, and it's very different. So it's, it's good to do the research and know where we're going, or even to know how they do things and take, take the positives Take right. those things that are done well, that work well, and incorporate them into what we do. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So you had that experience, and that was that was quite interesting, and yes. uh, and learning yeah. a lot, um, and and seeing family and stuff. So that that was great. And then you came back to Atlanta. Yes, I came back to Atlanta. Okay. I did. I came back to Atlanta, worked here again you know, and, um, you know, still with my same job. And I've been doing that all along. I've been doing that all along, back and forth, back and forth, Florida. And then I, my job is national. My job is national. So I'm, you know, I'm um, the only four states that I haven't been to is Alaska. Mm-hmm. I haven't been to Alaska, North Dakota, South Dakota. Hmm. There's one more. I want to say uh, Wisconsin. 
Okay. No, uh, no, that's not true. I've been to, I've oh. been to Wisconsin. North Dakota, South Dakota, Alaska. There's only four. I can't remember the fourth one. That's it. Okay. Wow. I mean, wow. I've spent a lot of time away. Mm -hmm. And it's been, I'm not surprised, right? Because, and people say to me all the time, oh, you love to travel. And I say, I don't know if I love to travel or if travel loves me because I'm always called to travel. Right. Um, but I do, I can say this honestly, honestly, I can say this, that if I'm home for longer than two weeks, I get very, very itchy. I get Interesting. I do, I've got to get on a plane, not a car. I've got to get on a plane. So Absolutely. something has happened to me over the last 50 years because I- Well, that, 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 that could be bits of, of your mom, of your mom yes. from moving around when you were younger. There's still that, you know, it, it leaves an impression or it leaves a mark or, or something that um that that's still part of you because that was you with your family when you were mm -hmm. quite young and and moving around a lot agreed i blame it on my mother all the time i says my mother's itchy feet that somehow she you know mm -hmm. got into my pores somewhere because right. I well, and and it's it's a good thing because it's where you're at now, and yeah. and if you didn't or you hated it, it you wouldn't be doing what you would be doing. That no. there would be some difference in in life. Absolutely, I wouldn't have had I wouldn't have this level of of uh, of career um, because the, it'll say you know must travel seventy percent of the time, which means a hundred. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, and so you've got to be versatile, and you've got to be adaptable and mutable and ch changeable you know things all kinds of things change and happen and you know I was listening to one of your shows about COVID and that's so funny because I was stuck in the airport right the day that they said okay all flights are grounded but I was already there to travel so um yeah and I traveled all through COVID all through it mm -hmm. yeah. I, I I traveled through COVID as well People yeah. like how, and I'm like, it's I, residency, citizenships, yeah, different places, like yeah. knowing what was going on. A lot of it is knowledge. It was knowing what was going on, which which countries had which rules. I, right. I've, I've taken a lot of COVID tests. I'll, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I ended up, I had to take a lot of COVID. I was like, I'm not staying stuck. If if I have to take a COVID test, then I remember we'll at one point, what was it? So I was in Montenegro. Uh -huh. and I was leaving Montenegro and I had to do a test before I left. And I got to Barcelona. They did a test on, on arrival, even though I had done one just bef like off before a two hour flight. And so I did another one. And then I was only in Barcelona for about three days, I think. And then I was flying back to Canada. And then, so I had to do a test again the day before leaving. And then when I arrived, I had a random selection test again. I was like, I've yeah. done four tests in like six days or something. But I just thought, you know what, whatever. If it allows me to travel, oh, that's, that's right. fine. I'll take the tests. I don't really care. I'm not right. being locked up or stuck in no. one single country. It's not I happening. Wasn't I wasn't either. It, it did not happen. I was not. I was. First of all, all I can say in this moment is that my sciences that I studied in college were virology, cytology, immunology. So I knew too much and I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. I knew too much. So I wasn't about to let all of that affect mm -hmm. me or my family. Right. Yeah. That's all I can tell you is that I, that was my actual, mm -hmm. and, my, and my job, I was in immunotherapy, immunotherapy. Right. So I so. knew in real time that everything isn't what it seems. That's all right. I knew. Mm-hmm. And I, I just knew that I love to travel and be places and there's no way I was going to stay stuck anywhere. And you could. And, and yeah, people and believe that's... they could not leave there. They believed it. Right. I had people that but never having, left. I know, but having also having multiple residencies and citizenships make a big difference as well. So it made it very easy because I was with my residency in Spain. I'm like, well, I'm a, I'm a resident. Here's my car. They're, oh yeah, no problem. Or I'm going back to Canada to visit family and friends. Well, I didn't say to visit, but I'm like, I'm a Canadian right, right. citizen. I'm going to Canada. Oh yeah, no problem. Yes. And so then, and that's when I really kind of really got to start to really start pushing things with global citizen life because it was just my lifestyle before. And people would right. ask me like, how do I do this or move here or do that? And I would yeah. always help. But once that the pandemic happened, that was then I thought, like, I there's a lot of people, you don't know what you don't know. 
Right. right? You don't. And, and that's reality. Like I didn't know a lot of things that I didn't know. And I figured it out over many years. Yeah. And so now yeah. with the things that I know, I can help people and share that. And, and then never, as I say, I will never be stuck under the control of any one single government ever in my life. Uh, yeah. Right. Agreed. Agreed. And that's why I said, when I saw your, your channel and this podcast and what you actually do, I'm like, this is phenomenal, right? This is a real resource because I'm not going to, I'm not going to live in the States, right? I've already decided that, you know, I'm, this is a, I'm on the back nine yeah. and, um, and I'm considering where I'm going to live and having a resource like yours is going to be absolutely 100% what we're going to need. I, of course, because I do not suggest just going flying by the seat of your pants. I don't suggest that. <laughs> well, no, you, you, you have to, I mean, uh, people need to look inwards. Like I, I've, I've dealt with and, and talked with people that, and, and have known people that just will, will up and move. And I'm, I'm actually kind of one of them, but I'm single. Yeah. And so it's easy for me to just up and move by myself because it is just right. me. Right. Um, but I've known people that their families move and they like when they moved to Costa Rica for six months, bought a, a, a restaurant yeah. and well, they, they moved there, bought a yeah. restaurant. And six months later, they moved back to the United States because they didn't like it. I'm like, yeah. do you know how much money they lost from selling all their stuff in the United States, <laughs> buying and Spending six I, months in Costa Rica, then selling everything. Because when you look, when you sell your house, okay, fine, maybe you'll make some money depending right. on how long you've had. But when you sell all your stuff in it, and then you have to rebuy it, and then six months later you're in another country and you do it again, it's like you just didn't do some proper research. Like what? Exactly. What are you looking for? Right. So right. when when it's your time to come, it'll be you know when you look at where you are at, at that stage of your life, what do you want? Right. What What are your values? What type of of right. politics do you want? What type of maybe right. religious factors you need to take into yes. consideration? Right. What geopolitics right. type things yes. are, are you want? Because the what I it's see true. what happens with some people is they, they want to change. They want different. They're they're lonely. They're sad. They don't like their yeah. life. I get it. We, we right. Most of us go sure. through stages of that. But sure. just because you move, if you're lonely, sad, and don't like your life, just you, you're going to enjoy for about six months because everything's all new in a new city. Exactly. But you know who you're stuck with yourself you, and you. if you're not right. happy with you it doesn't right. matter where in the world you go you're right. not going to be happy with you unless you keep moving every six months just to find new exactly. new new but eventually right. I've done that moved around a lot and trust me it gets old too yes absolutely that's why we talked about those roots um that's right. I you know because I've lived so many places I I know what I'm looking for but I'm not lonely or any of that stuff Mm -hmm. I just know the kind of lifestyle that lends to me being more creative, that right. gives me more of a creative outlet. You know, mm. if I'm seeing the rocks and the water and the cliffs and the, this, it lends more creativity. And then, you know, I want to do more my retreats full time and a place like that, you can offer mm -hmm. that to the, the, to the people that are assigned to you. Right. So that's right. the reason why I want to do it. And I, maybe I could find it in the United States. But I have a feeling that's because I've lived abroad and I love Europe so much. I when I go back home to Europe, I exhale. When I go to Jamaica, yeah. when I go to Jamaica, mm -hmm. I exhale. But it's it's not the safest place, and I'm not going to be. I'm not right. going to shy away from that, right? And mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not going to shy away from that fact. It's not the safest place, and I know I've been there a hundred times, and I've built a house there. It's not the safest place. For me right. personally, it's not the safest place. The Jamaicans will say, oh, don't be like that man. It's okay. And I'm going, yeah, for you guys, because you guys live here. You know, you guys right. live here every day. But I've had several family members. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's not we, we really need to look at you know, Everything. all, all of the, all of the aspects of what we want, the lifestyle we want, yeah. um, you know, and, and to take in, let, let's be honest, to take into consideration of religion and, yes. and things like that. Like I was recently in Dubai, uh, visiting yeah. a friend of mine. She's been to well over a hundred countries. Yeah. Um, and she loves Dubai. She, she has actually moved to Dubai now. Dubai is home. She lives there. She has a place, her business, like everything. And she absolutely yeah. loves it. And when I mentioned to a few people that I was going to Dubai, they're like, why would you want to go there? It's not safe. Or women, oh. women aren't treated very well. It's terrible. And mm -hmm. when I got there, I was like, oh my gosh, this place is so clean. 
Yes. And we were working one, one afternoon, um, on our computers and stuff. And her friend walks by and says, Hey, come outside on the terrace and let's, let's have a drink. She's like, Oh, okay, we'll, we'll be there in about 10 minutes. And so I start like packing up my computer and my purse and, and she's like, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm getting everything packed up. Mm-hmm. We're going to meet your friend for a drink. She was she's like, you can just leave it here. And I was like, no, I, I can't leave. Right. I live in Barcelona. I can't even go to the bathroom and leave my computer on the, t- like anywhere. No, like I can't even I've hang my there. purse on the back of my, my, my are you uh, kidding? Hair. I was mauled in Barcelona in the elevator. Yeah, it's, I've, I've, yeah. Crazy. And so, you know, and I, but I still love Barcelona. There's great things, but yeah, yeah you just, of course, you can't of leave course, your, but I can't I, leave I, your I, stuff. And she's like, yeah. no, 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 just leave it. And I look at her and I'm like, I'm taking my purse. Like I'm just, I'll leave my computer. Right. I'll no. chance it. Like I'm, I'm risking it. Right. And we were gone for well over an hour and our stuff was just there. Like things generally don't disappear. And I can't say that it would never happen, right. but they've got some pretty strict rules there. Like you break the law, you're in trouble. Right. And, you know, I kind of don't mind that because exactly when I'm because looking at Europe and parts of North America and things with what's going on, I'm thinking like, I, yeah, there's no I, consequences. Yeah, there's none. And there, there is like, they're not going to pickpocket. They're not going to steal from you. Like, it's so right. rare for those things to happen exactly. that, you know, and yes, it's more expensive, but I thought, well, okay, it has more time. Can... comparatively, we've got to, we've got to right. look, but what if am my... I getting for return? Exactly. My, my safety is like pretty much insured. I'm good yeah. with that. Right. I, I mean, that. I'm just good with that. No, I get it. Like I said, I, I'm just seriously thinking about it. I'm not sure where. But to your point, when it comes to, you know, li- like the, you know, safety and, and things like that, all of those things are to be considered. And that's why yes. you're, you know, what you offer is so powerful because at least you have somebody to say, hey, I don't, I'm thinking about this place. What all do I need to consider? Mm-hmm. And, you know, and have somebody coach you through that, right? Oh, I just, Right. I, I mean, I'm just excited because I really am thinking of a few places. And um, and sometimes and, and you I need to I... consider too is, you know, do you want to be close to your home country? Do you have aging parents? Do you have kids in college or university? Do you have grandkids you want to get all back to? You know, all of that. And weather, weather conditions. Are you okay with rainy season for three months or tropical storms and hurricanes and earthquakes? Exactly. And like, I don't like earthquakes. Right. I've been in a few. I don't like them. Like, I don't right. really want to be in a place that has earthquakes. That's great. So See? there's lots of, of little things that people really do need to consider because, you know, if you're making the move abroad, it's a big step. It costs money and we want you to enjoy life. Exactly. Again, if you don't like it, you can move on. Or sometimes it's just not the right city. It could be the right country. Right. And the right cities city. are different as well within the country. So. Right. Right. What do you like to do for entertainment? Is, do they offer what you like? You know, do you, like I'm a big theater person. For God's sakes, if they don't have the theater and jazz and, and little jazz clubs, you know, where I can just go mm-hmm. listen to live music. That's probably not my place. Right. 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 So Montenegro might not be on your list. <laughs> I'm not sure if many places. It's, it's just so small. It's just so small. It's beautiful. It's nature. And I, and I do right. love it there, but I, I do get bored. And so I, I've got this out where I, I'm kind of split my time between Barcelona and Montenegro. Okay. Is that so where you are for now? For me, it's the best of both. Well, currently while we're recording this right now, I'm in Canada, Okay. Um, but I'll be, I'll be heading back uh, shortly, I think. Um, but yeah, like I, I'm always, always try. I come to Canada once a year and, um, I, I love Barcelona, but sometimes I'm just like, oh, I just want some peace and quiet to get away from it all. And oh, yeah. I go to Montenegro and I'm in nature and it's quiet and I love it. And then after a while I'm bored, I'm like, oh, I'm so bored. I need to, I need more action. And I head back to Barcelona. And yes. so for me, that is good. I, I have friends in both, you know, and it's, mm-hmm. it's, I do have some, some kind of roots a little bit in both, um, Oh, nice. but I do get the best of both because, and it's the two or two and a half hour flight it's yeah nice. not not bad at all i i went to tenerife i went to madrid um okay. yeah it was, and then we had a big storm and i was stuck in tenerife for another five days oh, oh wow that was that. awful that you were stuck yeah. there in the islands yeah, that's very too sad, bad yeah <laughs> but um yeah it was good yeah good and so with your work you're now coaching people yes. Yes. And, and what, in what ways are you coaching them? What are you real? What are you mostly helping no, people no. with? Money, the energy of oh. money. Okay. I believe that money is 
energy. It's not just paper. Mm -hmm. And when, and it goes right back to when I was a child and um, immigrant parents and all that, but you know, money eluded me. Um, and that's because I, I realized now on mm -hmm. the other end now, cause I've been doing this for 20 years now that I had a money, money wound. And that's what I call the money wounds. And we've got four money identities that I've come up with. You've got the money monk hates money. Money's bad. It's the root of all evil. It's everybody's problem. Nobody needs to have it. It's terrible. That's the monk, the avoider. I don't want to see money. I don't want to have anything to do with it. I don't want to play my bills. I'm not going to look at any checks. I'm not going to write any checks. And if I do, I don't really know what I wrote. The avoider. That's me. The recovering. Okay. I am a recovering avoider okay. because I'm doing very, very well now. The spender. Mm. they spend it long before they have it they spend it when they do have it and if they don't have it they still spend it okay and the hoarder oh the hoarder they have keep it. it they keep never it, circulate it, it. it don't spend it don't spend it they don't spend it on themselves they don't spend it on others they're not generous i always my hoarder is ebenezer scrooge ah that's my hoarder he was sick he was debilitated and his little nephew was sick and he could easily, he would let a child die before he would help with childcare or food or the hoarder can get really, really dicey. Yeah. Okay. So I help people that find themselves paycheck to paycheck, mm -hmm. never have enough money, could actually make good money, still don't have it still never and don't understand why and they're sick of the rat race sick and tired of it what why don't i ever have enough money and that was me years and years ago and i was tired of it and i decided to do some just really sit and do some inner work on that and mm -hmm. went to went to classes and really what sparked it for me was i was listening to louise hay and she said money is the easiest thing in the world to attract and that really angered me. How dare she say something like that? That's not true. I'm broke and I work every day and I work hard and I work two jobs, three jobs. And, and I know I'm doing everything, everything right. So I don't know why she would say that. Oh, she was so right. Oh, she was so right. It's the easiest thing to attract once you become in the flow and understand and understand your own if you have them money wounds and i once i started on that path yes you know because i was a i became a life coach 20 years ago and i thought i'd be a career coach or a life mm -hmm. purpose coach you know and that's really where i was going but what was happening was i was, i was still doing the lot of the inner work around money but i didn't see that coming i didn't see that coming so I'm, I'm there helping people with their life and their career. But, this, you know, when you're coaching people, everything comes up. Right. So you're working on different parts of the life wheel because there's lots. Of, mm -hmm. You know, the life wheel has about eight sections, at least. Like you said, religion, you know, uh, finances, uh, career, relationship, you know, uh, parenting. It could be your life wheel. Right. And you right. and you name your life wheel. And then you look at all the areas of your life wheel where you're struggling and what I found is that the part of the life will where it was money or finances, that was the part of the life will that I was more gifted in helping people to look at. And because I had such a vested interest myself for me, and I started working on it for me, I started helping others work on it too. And I went from that to seven figures. And I had to look back and say, what all did I do? And when I started looking back at all that I did, I realized there was an actual, there was an actual method. And then I started helping other people with the method, right? Who are you? How did, what did you learn about money? Where did you get that from? Um, is that working for you now? Are you happy with where you are now? That sort of thing. Because some people are good, right? This is not mm -hmm. for everybody. Right. And some people are not good. And they always, those people, people, when they're not good, they fall into one of those four or a couple right. of those. And then now that you are aware, that it's not just you, 
right? It's not you. You, you, you developed money behaviors, money habits, and a money belief when you were younger. Mm-hmm. And it has followed you. You have fallen into that box. If you, if you had a, and money doesn't grow on trees. No, you're not going to get that. This, all of those things, there's no streets of gold out there. Um, or you had a parent that always spent their money, never had any money. You know, we've seen our, we've seen people squander money, you know, or we've seen people be so tight with money, right? All of that, you got it from somewhere. Is it Mm -hmm. serving me? It was no longer serving me. My parents argued over money and it got, sometimes it got violent when I was in England. And as a result of that, I was afraid. I, to me, money was a source of friction and, and, and pain and just really awkward. So I didn't want to have anything to do with it. The only thing is you tell you that self and subconsciously and you don't know you're living from that place every day. So you're working for money. You want it, but actually you don't. And you want it, but you're avoiding it. Mm-hmm. You, the two can't go together. Right. You can't want something, but avoid it. Right. It doesn't work. Universal law, it will not work. So I started getting into vibrational energy, universal law, and just working that all the way through and becoming congruent with the fact that I do want money. So I could not avoid it anymore. I had to look at it. I had to open up my bank account. I had to look at my checks. I had to look at my statements. I had to write it down, sing about it, right? Develop a healthy relationship with my money. Once I started, and it was an, and it was a long process, you know, and when I say a long process, because at first I didn't even know. Now I, I got it down and I can help people in much quicker time than I, right? It's, a, it's the mm. way it always is. It's not going to take everybody as long as it took me because I developed the the, the money identities and the wounds and the this and that and and how the vibrational energy and and everything else with the vibrational energy scale. So I've done all those, all that work to help people move through and get to a, get from here to there much quicker than I did. And um, finding out what the passive income streams, are you doing what you love? That'll come towards the end of, because I the abundance quest, you take the abundance quest with me and that's a 10, that's a one, it's a course and it's got uh, 10 chapters in it. But that being the case, you go from what vibrational energy do you sit at normally? What did you learn as a child? What are your limiting beliefs around money? To all the way to the other end where passive income streams, you know, living from a place of gratitude and above. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, understanding that if you're not doing uh, work that you love, it's still counterintuitive to making good money. Yes, there's a lot of people that make good money not doing what they love. However, that is counterintuitive to joy. Right. And I would say that that money is easier to leave you. Mm Mm-hmm. I've seen it over and over again. I hate this job. I don't like this job. The money's great. Then all of a sudden, everything goes south because right. you're not in a high vibrational space and in con- you're not congruent with the two. So I, you know, you get to that end of the where you're doing what you love, even if you're doing what you love and you're still working a job right now that doesn't necessarily make you happy, but it pays the bills. What happens mm-hmm. is your vibrational energy still rises because you're feeding your soul. Right. And you're still feeding your soul. Part-time is better than no time Mm -hmm. at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So if people wanted to work with you, what is the best Mm -hmm. way for them to get in touch with you? They can reach me at IamCharmin.com. There they can send me an email, you know, or, you know, IamCharmin at gmail.com is my email address. I'll definitely reach back out. But I've got my website, theabundancequest.net. You can go, you can get the course, you know, um, my book, The Lessons of a Life Coach. That's also on Amazon um, by Charmin Moore. So there's a lot of ways to reach me. There's a lot of ways. Perfect. And I'll make sure to put links to all of that in the show notes to make it even easier for everybody to get in touch with you. 
That's awesome. Thank you so much. I just want to say thank you so much for your time today. I know our listeners got a lot of valuable information and it was great speaking with you and I really appreciate it. Absolutely, Sally. It was a pleasure doing this podcast with you today. Um, Blessings on everything that you're doing out here to help everybody globally figure out what that looks like for them in their next steps. 